Oh, hey everyone. Hello. I'm going to kick off this thematic panel session. So good day to everyone, uh, wherever you are uh, in the world today. And welcome to this very exciting panel. I'm very honored to be moderating this panel, which will be looking at the practices of refugee legal aid in Middle Eastern protection contexts. My name is Elena Haversky. I'm the project manager of the Refugee Entitlements in Egypt project at the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies at the American University in Cairo. I'm delighted to moderate this panel, which was inspired by the Ref Arab project at the University of Oslo. This project seeks to examine the different avenues available for refugees in these countries in the region by means of non-governmental legal aid Organi uh, legal aid organizations, excuse me, and securing legal protection of the basis uh, human rights instruments and other domestic legislation within the region. The papers today, I'm very excited for you to hear, and they address a wide variety of topics from Egypt to Lebanon, uh, all the way to Iraq. By looking at the legal empowerment of refugees to the digital refugee lawyering in Iraq, legal and procedural gaps and challenges of refugee legal aid in Egypt, and finally, navigating protection in Lebanon, uh, attendees will have access to better understanding the roles and practices of local refugee legal aid for the access of rights of refugees in different Middle Eastern protection contexts. Full details and abstracts of the four papers today can be found in your conference program. Attendees are encouraged to put any questions in the chat box. Please make sure that you address all questions to both attendees and panelists. That way you might spark inspiration for other questions if people are able to, to see your questions. Each panelist will be given 10 minutes to present. So panelists, please try and stay on time. If you are not presenting, please keep your camera and microphone muted and off. And we're hoping that after all of these presentations, we will have ample time for discussion. And we look very much forward to that. And one final reminder that the session is being recorded and will be produced on a podcast. So if you do not want to participate in this recording, then we ask you to kindly leave the session now. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Martin Jones of the University of York in the UK. He will be discussing the past, present, and future of legal empowerment of refugees. Dr. Martin, the floor. Martin, your microphone is off. Oh my goodness! Um, well, the, what I was what I was trying to communicate before I begin my presentation, thank you, Miriam, um, was um, my thanks to my, both my appreciation of being back amongst friends and colleagues, many of whom I haven't seen for a long time. So um, it's, it's wonderful to see you all, even if only virtually. Um, but secondly, my appreciation of the of of uh, appreciation of all the organizers. There's um, not just David, but his, his much bigger team, I'm sure, who has spent countless hours um, making the logistics actually work um, phenomenally well. So um, it would be remiss of me to kind of jump straight into my presentation without, without giving that big welcome and, and, and thank you. Um, as Elena said, my topic today is really the how of refugee law rather than the more common who or what. Um, that is to say, the question that interests me is how is it that refugees come to enjoy their rights or to adopt a simpler phrasing how is it that refugees are protected i'm particularly interested in thinking through the role of legal protection or the role rather of the legal profession in particular lawyers in protection and i'm raising a further how question about its role how should the legal profession best be involved in protection or to put it that another way how does the way in which the legal profession work affect not just the protection outcomes, but the broader empowerment of individual refugees and refugee communities. In the time we have together, I'm going to raise questions rather than provide answers. I'm going to try and sketch out some answers, at least briefly, though. Um, but I, I want to draw upon examples from a couple of projects I'm involved in in the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, a region that I think is particularly important for us to examine in relation to these questions because of the historic perception that law, lawyers, and legal advocacy matter less here um, to refugee protection. 
it's a difficult region in which to ask these questions. And as a result, the lessons we draw from the region should travel well. Though I imagine we'll discuss this more in the conversation and questions after the presentations. I should also say in advance that I think these how questions have important implications for the who and what questions. Now, it's long been recognized that refugees are in a very difficult situation when it comes to claiming their rights. Firstly, many of the rights might be incompletely recognized or not recognized at all within their countries of asylum. Furthermore, the specific locations in which refugees reside, refugee camps, for example, and the actors with whom refugees are interacting may be subject to special legal rules. Secondly, refugees may be unaware of their rights and how to claim them, either because of the novelty of the challenges they face or the unintelligibility of the legal system of their new country of asylum. And thirdly, they may not have the capacity to seek the enjoyment of their rights through the legal system due to problems of physical access, language, and their ability to appropriately or persuasively present their case. The traditional response to these challenges has been the involvement of legal professionals, lawyers and paralegals, to support clients in seeking individual and systemic relief, a type of intervention that I'll use a broad understanding of the term legal aid to refer to. Now, the provision of legal aid to refugees is only addressed in passing in Article 16 of the Refugee Convention, which, as you'll recall, guarantees to refugees with habitual residence simply the same rights to legal assistance as enjoyed by nationals. And international human rights law hasn't historically added much by way of a right to legal aid, beyond it being an element of due process guaranteed to those undergoing criminal trial. In the MENA region and the Global South more generally, the underdevelopment of state-funded legal aid programs in all areas of law, including refugee law, has meant that the development of legal aid programming has been left to civil society, as you'll see from all of my examples in this presentation. A range of models have been developed by civil society organizations in the region, including um, the following, kind of divided into kind of three broad thrusts of, of legal aid interventions. The first being refugee community legal education programming, sometimes called street law and going by other names. Um, here I'm thinking of um, programs like the information provided by the Information Counseling and Legal Advice Program of the Norwegian Refugee Council to refugees in Lebanon on the risks of statelessness and the processes for registering births. The second is advice and representation in local and, and international um, administrative and judicial processes. And here I'm thinking of the representation provided to individual refugees and groups of refugees in detention and those facing deportation in Egypt by the Egyptian Foundation for Refugee Rights, about which I'm sure Mohammed Farhat will speak more later. Um, thirdly, I'm thinking also of strategic litigation, like the litigation undertaken by Frontier Zawad and Legal Agenda in Lebanon to contest the general security directives amending the conditions of entry and residency for Syrians. As these examples will show legal aid can be provided by a range of civil society organizations, both local and international, sometimes both. And they can also be operationalized through a range of models from centralized legal teams working exclusively on refugee legal aid to decentralized networks of lawyers who only focus occasionally on providing refugee legal aid as part of a pro bono contribution. But as I said at the outset, my goal was to ask how does the way in which legal profession works affect not just protection, but the broader empowerment of individual refugees and refugee communities? And I want to turn to this question because I think it underscores a type of systemic change that is often overlooked in the evaluation of refugee legal aid or legal aid even more generally. And that is the effect of being involved in legal advocacy on an individual community's own ability to claim their rights in the future. In short, is there a way of conducting legal advocacy, providing legal aid, that results not only in immediate success in relation to the claim, which is always important, but that has longer term positive effects on refugees involved in the advocacy? In short, how can legal advocacy for refugees and legal aid become legal empowerment of refugees? And here I'm drawing upon um, the term and the, the research and the programming that's being developed in relation to legal empowerment which is a relatively new term that's emerged out of discussions within the UN system about how to end chronic and extreme poverty. It also represented a historic and overdue shift from a focus on building formal state institutions of justice to informal non-state institutions of justice. The idea of legal empowerment is that the process of engagement in legal processes, whether formal or informal, both improves the immediate situation of affected individuals 
and progresses the broader task of having their voice heard within the political community. And I, I refer to political community liberty because interestingly, the project of legal empowerment is often described as reclaiming citizenship, a phrasing that seems firstly incompatible with the definition of refugee, but actually becomes a bit more intriguing when we think of our task as fostering local integration. Now in sketching out the questions and concerns, I'll necessarily generalize and be brief, especially with my remaining two minutes of time. Um, and even within the MENA region, I should say that the landscape of legal aid is diverse and, and that's for that reason alone, I look forward to discussing with you the extent to which my generalizations fit with your own experiences. Um, but I'm gonna raise three questions that bringing the legal empowerment literature to bear on the prison of legal aid, I think requires to grapple with. The first, first one is what rights do refugees care about? I mean, one of the premises of legal empowerment programming, not surprising given its origins in addressing extreme and chronic poverty is a focus on, econo on the economic situation of marginalized communities. Um, with particular attention to property rights, often land tenure in an agricultural context. Now, while refugees in urban situations may have disputes with landlords, settling these disputes may bring benefits, but it's less likely by itself to propel refugees individually or as communities to greater economic capacity. So the theory of change through which empowerment builds capacity may not be directly transferable to working with refugees. Exploring how legal advocacy results in broader systemic change begs the question about which rights are most important. And historically, refugee legal aid programs have focused more on issues of status than other types of issues. Turning to the second question, the second question is that the legal empowerment is forces us to answer is what are the challenges of involving refugees? One of the premises of legal empowerment is the direct involvement of beneficiaries um, in service provision. And here we have a, a new range of challenges. Refugee communities are often speaking different languages than host communities coming from different legal traditions and have varying status in the countries of asylum. Beyond these challenges, refugee communities are often in flux with individuals, including notably refugee community leaders, returning to countries of origin and moving onwards, whether by resettlement or regular means. Um, thirdly, um, the third question I think, and probably one of the most difficult ones, is what does it we mean by what do we mean by empowerment? Um, in asking about empowerment, we have to confront the ideological assumptions of the term. Does legal empowerment seek to improve the operation of the refugee protection regime or to replace it? Insofar as it's often grounded in the case-based methodology, refugee legal aid is an incrementally or an inherently incremental approach. And if we're being honest, the legal profession is an inherently conservative community of serving as guardians of our respective legal traditions. So in closing, without making the perfect the enemy of the good, ultimately the question is, will legal empowerment produce the change that is needed? And I think within the community of legal aid providers in the region, there's varying views on these questions. And there's broad experience within the societies in the region also grappling with this question. While the politics of legal empowerment is often described as the politics of voice and agency, I think it's also the politics of the change we seek, incremental or more revolutionary. And on that note, I thank you for your time, um, your indulgence, um, and I look forward to hearing my friends and colleagues' presentations and discussing both legal aid and empowerment with you further afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for that very interesting um, presentation and conversation. And looking forward to seeing the questions that arise from your, from your presentation, especially after the questions you rose. So thank you so much. Uh, now we turn to our second presentation of the day, Dr. Miriam Twicht and uh, the University of Oslo and Dr. Abdullah Yassin of the Erbil Polytechnic Institute, or sorry, Erbil Polytechnic University for their presentation on digital refugee lawyering, connectivity of legal aid practices for ensuring refugee protection in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So Dr. Ariam and Dr. Abdullah, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. And thank you so much for moderating. And thank you also, Martin, for a brilliant start of what will be a very exciting panel. I hope, I think, can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes, you can see it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. So yes. So today we're actually talking as well a bit about the future of legal aid as we're looking into the role that refugee legal support plays in the KRI and how this engages with the potentials of digital connectivity, for instance, for reaching more people, and the challenges such as surveillance and privacy concerns. 
So in total, we're planning to do around 30 interviews with people working for international organizations, international NGOs, local organizations working on legal aid and lawyers who directly engage with refugees and their rights in care in the KRI. But today we share some preliminary insights on drawing on seven interviews we've already done and we would love to get your input on this to take this further. So um, our research is actually part of the REF Arab project, which is a research project that explores what refugee protection looks like in states in the Arab Middle East that are non-party to the Refugee Convention, yet that are hosting large populations of refugees. Iraq is next to Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Turkey, included in the Syrian refugee response, but especially in comparison to Jordan and Lebanon, very little, with the exception of the work of my wonderful colleague here, Abdullah Yassin, has been written on what refugee protection looks like in Iraq. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in this conference. So outline of our talk, besides being host to more than 280,000 refugees, Iraq is also undergoing its own post-conflict transition as a regime of uh, ISIS resulting in destruction and large numbers of internal displacement and in a struggle with the economic issues such as country depends largely on oil export and faces corruption. This makes our project even more incredibly interesting but also complex dance at the same time. So today, uh, the talk we focus mainly on three points. First, we unpack the concept of digital refugee lawyering. We then provide an overview of the legal framework that plays a role and how refugee protection in Iraq and in particular in the region takes shape. In the final section, we focus more on what, means, uh, what this means for the digital practices of legal aid. So refugees and legal aid can be split into interrelated components, such as civil matters often require additional legal support pertaining to people's legalized or le illegalized status, bureaucratic difficulties. Um, people seeking refuge often also require legal support in their interactions with the humanitarian regime, for instance, as UNHCR tends to play a key role in many southern nation states for refugee status determination and consideration for resettlement. And as UNHCR's practices are increasingly data-driven, as procedures are to assess vulnerability and determine needs are increasingly automated, and in response to COVID-19, interactions with UNHCR as well as with legal aid professionals are increasingly done remotely. We think the concept of digital refugee lawyering is very interested to look at. So if and how legal aid professionals can engage with technologies to negotiate their positions and their rights, but also beyond object of inquiry, we also argue it's a method. First, because we are obviously doing much of our research remotely. And second, because we ask with refugees and with lawyers, how and what could work in practice, considering the difficult legal realities that these people are navigating in. Yeah, so it's important now to kind of discuss the legal framework in the Kurdistan and in Iraq also uh, to the refugees. So more than 99% of refugees in, in Iraq are residing in the Kurdistan region. Further explains our focus on that research. Uh, Kurdistan region is an autonomous federal state, also known as Iraqi Kurdistan. Geogra geographical proximity, safety, stability within the region, linked as well as to the fellow Kurdishness for Kurdish refugees might explain this pattern of settlement. So for example, refu Syrian refugees coming to the Kurdish part of Iraq. Despite not being signatory to the refugee convention, there is rather elaborative protection framework, but it's not yet comprehensive, this framework. So the 1970, uh, 1971 refugee law defines uh, people seeking asylum for political or military purpose as a refugee, as a refugee, and has established similar rights to Iraqi nationals, such as healthcare, education, uh, and work. In 2009, this definition has been broadened in line with the Refugee Convention. Aside of these two I've just mentioned, aside of these two laws I've just mentioned, this is, there is also with, uh, that would provide for foreign nationals who have stayed in Iraq for more than 10 years. Um, there is a law, that provides this, um, this uh, right or opportunity to obtain Iraq citizenship. However, this is not the case in practice. Ha. 
how the two domestic refugee laws are implemented also differs per region. For instance, in federal Iraq, refugees require work permit, which is not the case in the Kurdistan. And refugee residing in federal Iraq would still be at risk of uh, detention for illegal entry. In, in the Kurdistan region, people seeking protection need to register with the UNHCR, which designates them as a certificate of asylum seekers. Kurdish, uh, Kurdistan has become a region of camps. There are 19 camps, there are 19 IDP camps and 10 refugee camps in this small region. There are almost 250,000 uh, people of concern registered with the UNHCR from Syria, uh, are residing in uh, residing in Kurdistan in the camps and in the urban areas, in the cities. Obtaining a just certificate, if they, uh, the, those people who obtain a certificate have to, that's if, if they pass the security check of Asaish, which is a big if, the Kurdish, uh, Asaish, we mean the Kurdish security organization. UNHCR certificate then provides the ability to obtain electronic recognized uh, tariff residency card which provides access to most rights, such as, as I said, right to work, education, healthcare, that's offered to Iraqi nationals. This residency card needs to be annually review, uh, renewed. Again, this is subjected to security clearance and asaish, as I said. Moreover, persons who have entered the KRI by air to airports are required to have a sponsorship, kafala, who needs to renew this sponsorship every year. More than 40,000 refugees have other national, uh, nationalities or backgrounds such as Turks, Iranian, and Palestine. Many of these people, as, a, as one of the legal aid professionals explained to us during the interview, would not have a UNHCR certificate because they do not have uh, all the uh, ASAIH approval, which requires again, which refers again to the security clearance we mentioned above. Apart from the, the statistics I mentioned about the refugees, there are also 600,000 IDPs in the three provinces of Kurdistan. In rest of Iraq, IDPs have been encouraged to return to their regions of origin. This has not been the case in the KRI. So we've been speaking to several organizations operating as partners of UNHCR and who are providing legal support. Their activities consist of legal counseling, legal awareness, legal accompaniment, support with obtaining documentation, court representation, and support when in detention. We have noticed that there has become a sort of hybrid form of legal aid, especially in response to COVID. This has become sort of um, accelerated. Much more has been done online, for instance, awareness sessions that were done using Zoom or WhatsApp, but this coincides with like the paper forms that are still needed in court. And then this comes to sit next together again with um, the use of UNHCR's database, RICE. Many clients have access to smartphones, but internet can be costly and there are helplines. For instance, WhatsApp is used to send photocopies of medical documents to cut transportation costs. But much continues to be done offline as well, such as house visits, legal clients, this relates to some extent to clients feeling more comfortable with physical meetings. And this is even more the case in, sens in regard to sensitive cases, such as gender-based violence. Other people require beyond information, legal accompaniment or support with paying documentation fees. And that cannot be easily done online, of course. On this point, in regards to the documentation fees, there's also some advocacy going on. For instance, organizations work together with UNHCR, have worked together with UNHCR for getting exemption for overstaying their uh, residency. Data protection is a concern, but mostly in relation to international legislation and UNHCR's data protection policy. Organizations are generally reluctant to use Facebook because clients would too easily share their personal information, names, UNHCR ID numbers publicly. And whereas some of the legal aid professionals blame this on clients' ignorance, it can be equally argued that this relates to the difficult circumstances that people find themselves in. Moreover, and aside of this, it was argued that Asayas already knows everything anyhow. Iraq and Kurdistan do not have domestic legislation regarding data protection, but there is legislation that provides much opportunity for surveillance under the guise of security. Okay, so our initial findings. So we found that those who do not carry UNICEF certificate 
are excluded from legal support. Interestingly, we found that the legal aid professionals we interviewed would refer to uh, people who do not pass the security check as political refugees to contrast with them civilians. But these teams do, to defeat the purpose of 1971 refugee law and the refugee convention. So ASAISH or the security, uh, security service would exclude potentially three categories of people. People who have been involved in a military, also in Syria, those who committed crimes such as drugs, spying or terrorism, people who have also have illnesses such as hepatitis or HIV. This seems to be a limited legal support for when a mistake is made in a security clearance. Also, as, also there is, as far as now we know, no legal assistance in place during the refugee status determination and the consideration for resettlement to third countries. Despite this being UNICEF, own procedural standard for signatory states. So we will wrap up now because I realize we're over our time. Uh, we are in the process of doing more data collections also with uh, organizations that are not implementing partners of UNHCR. At least two INGOs are actually setting up digital legal aid programs in the KRI as we speak. Um, but what we want to point out is like the importance of the security clearance because those who have who pass have relatively favorable rights and access to legal aid if we compare it to other refugees residing in other countries in the region. But of course, insecurity about the future remains. Um, in regards to the security clearance, there are high levels of discretion as well as unclarity among legal aid professionals of what can be done in response. Also, more can be done to provide information and have safe interactions using digital connectivity. But we found that innovation will never, most likely will not replace the need for offline interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam and Abdullah, for that very interesting uh, presentation. And I look forward to receiving questions. I find the idea of digital lawyering very interesting, especially as you said now with the onset of Corona. Uh, next up, we have Mohammed Farahat. Mohammed is a lawyer at the Egyptian Foundation for Refugee Rights in Cairo, Egypt, and he will be uh, discussing his presentation on the challenges of refugee legal aid in Egypt, legal and procedural gaps. So now I hand it over to my colleague, Mohammed Farahat. Mohammed, you are muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Selena, and thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this discussion. I meet with uh, my old friends. Uh, actually, you put me in the different position after Martin, Mariam, and Abdallah uh, presentation and int intervention, because I forced to change some ideas to also uh, uh, addressing some issues that released uh, during their uh, presentation, but let me to start quickly by giving the some introduction and background about the situation in Egypt. Uh, uh, a level of, of the legal framework, Egypt is, uh, is one of the countries part in 1950, uh, 1951 convention and 1969 convention, African convention. Uh, Egypt then we don't have uh, in Egypt, there is no uh, any national legislation organizing the situation of refugees. Uh, and for that, as or as a result of that, most of or all of refugees in somehow is treated as a foreigner, not as refugees or not uh, taking in consideration their situation, their special situation as refugees. Uh, and they, in some uh, uh, governmental uh, institutions, they ask them to provide some documents uh, as a foreigner. Uh, also, Egypt is considered as one of, of the, the countries to receive refugees from uh, different countries. Uh, now, uh, according to the statistics of UNHCR, Egypt now uh, have, uh, has uh, around uh, three, uh, 300,000 uh, refugees from 90, uh, 59 countries, different countries. Most of, of the countries in Egypt from come from Syria, from Sudan, from uh, South Sudan, from Ethiopia, from Eritrea, from Somalia. 
uh, this, this quick overview about the situation in, in, in Egypt. Uh, the second point is about the challenge and the gaps. And I will divide this challenge and the gaps into two parts. The first part will speak about the general challenge and gaps. And the second one is the challenge and gaps uh, in time of COVID-19. If you speak about the in general protection gaps in Egypt and procedural gaps in Egypt, we speak about like the first leak of the national uh, legislation. And it, as, as I mentioned that we, we don't have in Egypt, there is no uh, any national uh, law to organize the refugees uh, situation. So this means that when we go to the refugee would like to, to deal with different governmental institutions, they cannot like argue with the 1951 convention because the government official will not use this or no, maybe they don't know about the, the refugee situation. They don't know about the 1951 convention. They don't know anything about the international law. But if you provide national laws, this is, okay, this is Egyptian law for refugees, so they can deal with them. This is the first uh, uh, gap. Uh, also, uh, the, the, what also is, has uh, adverse impact on providing legal aid in Egypt, uh, it's the shortage of the, in, in the number of the qualified lawyers who are providing the legal assistance. I think this situation is not only uh, related to Egypt, but I think in all the legal uh, aid organization in the MENA region, uh, they face or encounter this problem, the shortage of qualified lawyers. And for example, in Egypt, I think the lawyers who are qualified to working with refugees is not exceed 20, 20 lawyers in all the Egypt, not in Cairo, not in all the Egypt. Uh, I think this the situation is the same in, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in, in Jordan, in, in, in any country in, in the MENA region, in Tunisia as well. Uh, also, one of the problem or the gaps uh, is lack of financial sources. Because as you know, now we have uh, Egypt. Uh, is now you can say daily receive uh, uh, refugees come from Sudan, come from Syria, uh, and the number of refugees and the same seeker is is daily is is, is always increased. Uh, in, in another side, the lawyers or the number of qualified, qualified lawyers or organization providing legal assistance is the same, the same, since uh, ten years ago. So this also is is make a pressure on the, the lawyers, qualified lawyers, or the organization providing legal aid. Because in, in the end, in some time, you will face or you will find yourself that you, you need to, to select the cases. Select the cases you would like to provide the legal assistance. This is the same with UNSR. If the refugees approach to UNSR seeking for legal assistance, they, they, they force it to select the, the beneficiary who will refer to the legal assistance. So I think this is one of also in the gaps in the normal time, not related to COVID-19. Deportation or deportation orders also is one of the gaps in the law because in, uh, as I mentioned, it's organized by the, the law, organizes the situation of foreigners. So the problem of deportation uh, orders is like, is the administrative order is issued in one, in one, one, minute, one minute and it could be implemented in one minute. That's mean the lawyers, don't have enough time to challenge this order or to bring the case before the courts to, 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 to cancel or to change this order. So this one of its challenge. Also, uh, the residence procedures, the residence permit procedure. Egypt, one of the countries is asked the refugees to, uh, they have to, to get the residence permit. Like, uh, I think the, the situation is different in other countries like Jordan, for example, didn't require uh, for residence permits, just issued the uh, ID for refugees. So the procedure of residence permit, it's take a long time because according to the Egyptian law, it's the old period is six months, but the procedure to issue the residence permit, it's take around four months or five months. So that means that you need to, to renew, to start the procedure to renew the residence permit each, uh, each month. Uh, also one of the, the gaps and in the procedure, the UNSR card itself is not recognized by uh, many of organizations uh, or uh, government institutions like banks or uh, uh, communication companies they ask for passport not ask for residents for uh, or not admit the, the, the our cards and also in other uh, in other governmental institutions like if you would, would go to, to get married officially you need to to, to provide the passport not the our card uh, also, one of the challenges and the gaps is the work permit, according to the Egyptian law. Uh, although there is no any uh, problem or any legal restriction 
of issuing a work permit for refugees, but they now still have a problem to, to issue the residency permit and also the, the residence, uh, sorry, work permit. Also the residency permit they get from the, the Minister of Immigration, uh, the, the, the Immigration Authority, they st you know, clearly stated that this agency allow you to, to work. And of course, this, this problem makes the, the refugees always in, in under the situation of exploitation by the, the employer. Uh, also, the RSD pr procedures is one of the gaps because, uh, unfortunately, in Egypt, the applicant or the refugee will come and register when you say, oh, they have to wait until, uh, at least one or two years to get the appointment to, to, for a RSD interview. And after the uh, RSD interview, we have to wait one year or two years or three years now to, to get the, the, the result. And after this all waiting time, you can get rejection, rejection uh, decision and you have to to appeal and you also to wait for two or three more years to get the, the, the result of the, the RSD uh, uh, result. Also, I, back to, to the residence, also one of the procedure also, uh, the, the problem also is that the applicant or the refugees in, in, in the time between uh, start the process to get the residence permit and to get, uh, and to get or finally get the residence permit, you are, you are faced the uh, detention for lack of residency. Even if you start and we have the, have the documents or have a paper uh, demonstrate that you have started the process to get the residency, but you are still uh, 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 potentially to, 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 to be detained for lack of residence. Uh, also, uh, one of gaps uh, related to uh, what Mariam and Abdullah present in, in presentation said about the digital rights of refugees is one of the problem because uh, as I mentioned, that the residence permit and uh, not all, uh, the, um, sorry, the communication company in Egypt is not recognized in our card to uh, to give you the, the, the same card, a mobile same card, or to uh, to have uh, internet uh, in, in in your own in your home or in your mobile. So this one of the problem. If we're speaking because there's a presentation about the the legal aid or, or digital legal aid for refugees. So that means that we need to ensure that the refugees, all refugees have uh, have contact with connectors online or they are online and they have access to internet to can use this. But unfortunately, because uh, the- Mohammed, the, sorry, the, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So uh, in, okay, sorry. Under the COVID, in, in, in COVID-19, the situation is, come uh, also to consult the gaps because the UNCR is closed the doors and they didn't uh, receive anyone from refugees in their uh, premises. So the UNCR, as uh, most of refugees now in Egypt have uh, uh, expired UNCR card. Of course, they are uh, detained or may uh, subject to detention uh, to detain for uh, lack of, uh, lack of uh, residency permit. And also, uh, uh, of course, there is some some of they don't have access to education because they don't have the residency permit. The last thing, the solution is a quick, quick uh, uh, solution. I think the, the first one to adopt the national legislation uh, related to refugees. I think also, we need to increase the capacity building for lawyers who are working with refugees. Uh, also, we need to using to focus on using strategic litigation uh, uh, as a mechanism to change the existing policies and uh, 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 and the gaps and to fix it, the, the, the protection gaps. Uh, I think the UNICEF also uh, have to find the solution to renew our cards and also to accelerate the RSD procedure and the uh, decision. Uh, it's changed, I think, also to change the to duration of the, uh, the residency permit from six months to, uh, to be at least one year, uh, providing work permit for refugees to avoid uh, to avoid exploitation, uh, stop deportation, uh, stop deportation orders. Uh, when uh, this uh, orders a challenge before the the courts, uh, as Mar Martin mentioned about the legal empowerment, it's very very important to to empower the refugees community to take some uh, some small legal action or like we can say that as the first legal action. Uh, of course, in light of the lack of funds and uh, lack of uh, or shortage in the number of qualified lawyers. Uh, in general, the last one, I think, is adopting advocacy plan uh, in, uh, in national and in, in regional uh, level to, 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 
uh, to, to, to solve these protection issues uh, in the MENA. Uh, and thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any question related to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that. Again, very interesting presentation, especially Egypt as a country that has signed the 1951 convention, uh, but we still see all these, these challenges and gaps. So thank you for bringing them to our attention uh, and also for your recommendations. And I look forward to the questions related to your discussion. And last but certainly not least, uh, is Nora Mills Johnson, also of the University of Oslo, and we're going to be going back to the Levant region, and she will be speaking on navigating protection in Lebanon, refugee legal aid, and humanitarian operations. Uh, so Nora, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Elena, for the introduction and also to my fellow panelists for such uh, interesting presentations. I'm going to share some slides with you. There, let me know if you can't see them properly. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, as a young researcher, it's it's really such an honor to be part of this conference together with so many inspiring colleagues across the world. So thank you a lot to the organizers. Um, I think my presentation will speak very well to, to Martin's uh, presentation and also many of the points raised by in the others uh, by focusing on one a specific aspect of, of legal aid to refugees, namely refugee legal aid in humanitarian operations. And I will do so by focusing on Lebanon. Um, so um, the question I want to explore in this presentation um, is what does legal aid look like when provided by a humanitarian organization? And I focus on the work of one leading international humanitarian organization providing legal aid to refugees across Lebanon. My paper is uh, based on field research I did in Lebanon at the beginning of 2020 for my master's thesis and also as part of the Ref Arab project that Miriam mentioned. Uh, and I'm currently working on, on writing it into an article, so any, any feedback is much appreciated in this regard. Um, so in this presentation, I will argue that when humanitarian organizations venture into providing legal aid to refugees, the unresolved relationship of rights and humanitarianism is brought to the fore. The humanitarian organization I studied provides legal aid to refugees in a context of increasingly restrictive policies. Lebanon is not party to the Refugee Convention, and it, uh, refugees are not afforded any special status under Lebanese laws. Instead, the presence of refugees is largely governed through elite bargain decisions, some of which are kept confidential. And this uncertainty has been argued to be both deliberate and in service of political interests. And Lebanon's sectarian power sharing interacts uneasily with institutionalized responses to refugee protection and the principles of rule of law. Uh, political interference with the judiciary is also not uncommon, and judgments challenging the political interests of the governments are not necessarily enforced. Uh, so in this restrictive context, how did a humanitarian organization as that it go about providing legal aid to refugees? I found that the organization would generally refrain from outrightly challenging the government's restrictive refugee policies. This is because they perceived it to involve a risk of backlash, uh, potential harm for the individual client, and to just generally be in vain. Instead of using legal aid as a tool to confront restrictive policies, the organization opted for practice practical solutions by exploring possibilities within the existing bounds of the legal and policy framework. Um, its activities focus on assisting refugees in navigating the fragmented and often inconsistently applied administrative procedures for legal residency and civil registration. Um, and um, yes, uh, so providing legal aid based on a framework that is not designed for the protection of refugees is far from straightforward. The politically pragmatic approach uh, that the organization adopted for in search for prag uh, practical solutions here and now may create new forms of risk or reproduce precarity further down the road. 
And one example I'd like to highlight in this regard is how this humanitarian organization make use of a so-called pledge of responsibility to assist ref uh, Syrian refugees in obtaining legal residency. Um, so after the Lebanese government requested UNHCR to stop registering refugees in 2015, the only option to be considered lawfully present in the country for Syrian refugees who did not obtain a UNHCR certificate prior to this date is to find a Lebanese sponsor willing to pledge responsibility for their stay. Residency based on a pledge of responsibility, it's not identical to the region's notorious capitalist system, but it mirrors the same exploitative dynamic. And this is because the foreigner's residency is tied to the contractual relationship with the employer that is sponsoring the, uh, the residency. But because it's currently the only option of legal residency for a large number of Syrian refugees, assisting refugees in applying for residency based on a pledge of responsibility, it certainly is the pragmatic uh, solution. Uh, but this uh, pragmatic approach still raises questions about the role of a humanitarian organization in assisting Syrian refugees entering into this contractual relationship. It protects them from the severe consequences of a legalized stay in the now, but it might expose them to exploitations in, in the hands of potentially ill-meaning sponsors in the future. Extending sponsor the sponsorship system to Syrians is also noted to be part of the government's effort to frame Syrian refugees as economic migrants. And during my field research, I was told that Syrians, especially men of working age, are sometimes requested to find a sponsor, even if they are registered with UNHCR, because residency based on a UNHCR certificate used to ban refugees from working. Assisting refugees in obtaining residency based on a pledge of responsibility then also question, raises questions about the role, if any, that the humanitarian organization has in reproducing the narrative of Syrians as economic migrants. So my argument, as I have already stated, is that when humanitarian organizations venture into providing legal aid to refugees, the long-standing tension of humanitarianism and rights is brought to the fore. Legal aid is inherently rights-based in its quest to enable marginalized people to benefit from the law. Humanitarianism, on the other hand, has traditionally been concerned with providing life-saving uh, relief in emergency situations. The focus of humanitarian organizations has been on immediate needs rather than rights. In contrast, a focus on rights goes beyond the immediate needs and looking into the future. And even as rights talk has infiltrated humanitarian discourse and operations, the tension of the two remains. Rights claims are necessarily political and they typically involve activism and advocacy. Humanitarian organizations, on the other side, they generally seek to maintain a safe distance from politics. The traditional principles of neutrality and independence are still instrumental, as those in power are considered to be more likely to let humanitarians operate freely if they don't consider them to be a threat to their interests. Humanitarian organizations have instead relied on pragmatic humanitarian diplomacy for the purpose of maintaining access to the populations they seek to assist. This necessarily involves compromise, as those determining the access are often the same ones that are causing the oppression, and speaking out comes with a risk of backlash. Humanitarianism, then, is often criticized for having a depoliticizing effect and for fostering an ideology of pragmatism in which structural issues are framed as um, technical problems in need of a technical fix. So, Four, well, almost there. So, what happens then when humanitarian organizations add legal aid to the repertoire of services they deliver? Um, the unresolved rights and humanitarian nexus points to a number of dilemmas in this regard. To what extent can and should humanitarian organizations outrightly confront the policy and legal framework of the state in which they operate? And can legal aid be effective when approached with humanitarian pragmatism? In my case study from Lebanon, the humanitarian way of doing legal aid involved shying away from directly confronting restrictive policies and instead navigating the existing possibilities for protection in the here and now. 
and I will conclude on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nora, for that very interesting uh, discussion. And I find it interesting how you looked at the pragmatism within Lebanon. So we do have some very interesting questions in the chat box. So I'm going to address them first to the panelists who they were addressed to. And then I see some more broader questions that maybe then we can we can discuss as a, as a panel. So the first question is for Martin. So great presentation, which raises important questions, the concept of empowerment. It seems to imply some substantive point of reference, i.e. empowered in relation to refugees. What is the appropriate point of reference in the context of refugee lawyering uh, legal aid? So Martin, if you wanna perhaps uh, take that question with uh, about two minutes, and then you have another one in the chat that I will then give to you. Sure. Yeah, no, it's an excellent question, David. And I mean, one of my hesitancies, I've been a only fairly recent um, adopter of the language of legal impairment. And one of my hesitancies along the way has been kind of a bit of the fuzziness of exactly what this term means. Um, I think in the end, I've concluded that it's pointed to something important, um, even if it still seems to be in some of the literature a bit fuzzy. Um, I've increasingly been drawn to some of the literature that talks about subjective um, ideas of legal impairment. And so kind of it recognizes that um, really what we're talking about is people's sense of agency and community sense of agency, so either at the individual or collective level, about solving their problems. Um, and it breaks it down and saying kind of, well, you have to actually be able to solve your problems. Um, I mean, a subjective sense that is delusory isn't much use, um, but you need to also not only be able to solve your problems, but actually um, believe that you, you can, um, because even if you could solve your problems, if you don't believe you can, you're not going to act, you're not, the agency is going to be, going to be um, not acted upon, not taken up. Um, and so there's a literature, um, um, Gramatikov, I think, um, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, in Porter, um, about a decade ago, began doing some work on uh, measuring subjective senses of empowerment. Um, that is really quite interesting. So basically asking people questions about how well, if you had this type of problem, do you think you'd be able to solve it? Um, and for me, in terms of measuring legal empowerment within programming, I mean, the question then becomes, is there a way that we can create baselines either before and then after our interventions or baselines within communities about how well they feel that um, the particular intervention that is supposed to be empowering has actually produced those kind of results. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not it's not perfect. And um, I think Golub has also developed some methodologies in terms of focus group procedures and, and questionnaires that um, that can begin to point to that. But it's a really important question because, um, you know, I think one of the tasks of legal empowerment is really trying to figure out what it is that we're actually talking about. And so what it is that we're trying to measure, what it is we're trying to get towards is, is, is really a key question. And a two-pronged question, Martin, from Tanya Raitan. So how legal empowerment is in practice linked to the longer-term empowerment in terms of socioeconomic inclusion and integration of refugees within the host country? And also, what do you mean by stating that legal empowerment could improve or replace um, the refugee regime? So could you draw a bit more on this very interesting thought from Tanya? Yeah. I mean, the, the first one, I mean, in, in a way overlaps a bit with David's um, and, and asks really, what are we trying to get at? Um, and I guess it, it's a model of change that is, is linked, like I said, I mean, because of its origins to kind of the underlying economic strength of a community. Um, I mean, it's kind of primarily a, a response to, to chronic um, extreme poverty. Um, and I think the, the theory is that um, by intervening and increasing the economic capacity of a community and of individuals within the community, you're then building their ability to then um, disrupt power relations and allow them to affect a, a broader range of their rights. Um, closely linked to that is this idea that not only do we produce kind of legal empowerment in a sense of being people being able to solve their problems, but that there's also political engagement. And so that's why I spoke about senses of political community that don't really fit so well with, um, with refugees because they're by definition outside the political community. And so when evaluating legal empowerment, one of the traditional approaches is to ask not simply subjectively, do people feel like they can act, take up their agency more, but also what's their level of engagement in policymaking and in the formation of policies that are affecting them. And that's really one of the big challenges I think for, um, 
for refugee legal empowerment? I mean, how do we understand that? And what is the willingness of our states that we're directing our advocacy towards to really allow those kind of engagements? Because in my experience, it's, 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 it's in, um, in so many different ways quite difficult to bring refugees literally into the room to talk about refugee policy with states. Um, on the second question, in terms of the revolutionary plans, um, I guess part of the question goes back to the who and the what. Um, and I think one of the things that legal empowerment and legal aid more generally forces us to ask is, is talking about refugees and refugees' rights the best approach for these communities? Um, is there some other way of understanding them that somehow fits better with what we think our political goals should be? I mean, and, and here is raising the question of, to what extent do we actually want to reinforce or do we want to undermine, in a sense, the global governance of migration? Um, and, you know, so, so these are the same kind of questions raised by, you know, social movements like the Sans Papier movement in, in, in Europe. And, and I think it forces us to really ask questions about how we conduct our advocacy and, and to make it more concrete. You know, in a, in a Cairo, Egypt context, right, the historic example is the, the Sudanese protests in front of UNHCR protesting a sudden change in UNHCR's resettlement policy that ended up in, in violence and death and, and strong resistance by UNHCR. Um, you know, is the role of lawyers like stopping the protest from happening in the first place? Or is the role of lawyers facilitating that protest and protecting the participants of that protest and trying to mitigate the, the police actions, um, but, but recognizing that actually the protest is legitimate and, um, and really is part of the revolutionary change that we need to push for. Um, I know in, in, in Cairo these days, the idea of protest brings with it all sorts of other connotations, but I guess what I'm asking are, ourselves is saying that we need to ask ourselves is kind of what is our role I mean to, to pick up the old language of Babia right um, we talked about us as asylum lawyers being internationalist gatekeepers I mean what is our role in terms of legitimizing oppressions um, and you know I think if we're going to start phrasing things in terms of you know fairly idealistic language of empowerment we really have to grapple with those kind of questions about our role in actually um, furthering or undermining the project of freedom of, of the people that we're working with. Thank you so much, Martin. I'm now going to turn it over to Miriam and um, Abdullah. There's a question for you also from Professor David Cantor. Uh, so in, in light of the question that he had also to Martin, what does legal empowerment or the end point of legal aid uh, means differ, especially in the Kurdish uh, Iraqi context between Iraqi IDPs and refugees from outside the country. So Mariam and Abdullah, if you would like to answer. Yes. Um, so thank you, David, for this really interesting question. Thank you also, Martin, for your brilliant intervention. Um, we so one of the things we find really interesting is the sort of differentiation between IDPs and refugees, right? And so there is, because a lot of the Syrian refugees are actually Kurdish refugees. So they are sort of considered as part of the same sort of, even though they have different civic identity, they are sort of considered as having the same national background to a large extent. Whereas with IDPs, um, especially those from federal Iraq, uh, this is less so the case. So there is also like the sort of differentiation and to that extent discrimination against Arab speaking, Arab identifying people. So, um, and to what extent who has access to what rights and have has full access to rights as nationals would have. So IDPs, for instance, even though they, so they are Iraqi nationals, but they are not allowed to vote in Kurdish uh, elections. So that is the question, of course, as what Martin also points out to, like what is the end point of legal empowerment? Um, and I think as Martin also addressed, like, well, the, the central point in legal empowerment is actually power. So the, like to what extent do people in an IDP or refugee position have the same ID and, and the feelings and the sort of realities that they are in charge and able to enjoy their lives? Um, I'm blabbing, I'm sorry. I think, Abdullah, do you have any additions to what I'm saying? No. 
<laughs> but it is the, the differentiation between IDPs and refugees is very interesting. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, Mohammed, there's a question here for you. So in several countries, university-based refugee law clinics provided important source of legal aid for refugees. So do you see a similar role for universities and students in Egypt or perhaps in other Middle Eastern uh, contexts? Uh, Mohammed, maybe if you want to take this question or if other panelists also uh, have some thoughts on that, perhaps after Mohammed um, speaks, we can also open up to all of the panelists. Okay, uh, the legal clinic for uh, the legal clinic for refugees is very important, and we spoke on this issue from three, uh, five or six years ago, uh, and we stressed that we have to have this uh, type of clinics in Egypt. But unfortunately, we don't have uh, a specific uh, legal clinic to providing legal assistance for for refugees, especially in uh, within the the governmental uh, universities. But uh, to be honest, we have one uh, in, in the experience in Egypt, Swiss, uh, one legal clinic, uh, but it's related in smuggling, not uh, trafficking, not in refugees. It was in uh, the faculty of law in uh, Alexandria University. But until now, we don't have. But I think we need to, to focus on this, especially within the governmental uh, universe. And I, to, also, to be honest with you, it's not, it's not easy to to, to, to convince the governmental uh, universities and officials to have like this uh, type of uh, clinic uh, or legal clinics uh, in Egypt. But I think we need to, to work on this in, uh, within the upcoming years. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Does anyone else want to uh, add on to what Mohammed said about maybe perhaps other countries, Iraq, Lebanon, the idea of having these refugee law clinics within universities? Perhaps Miriam or Nora Abdullah. I mean that, like, I mean that's the interesting part about KRI. I find is that there are quite a few, like, because of the sort of legal aid organizations that we've been looking at, there are quite a few lawyers that are engaged in refugee law or increasingly, but a lot of them do not actually have a background in refugee law. So they, for instance, have a background in criminal law. So, but I do think there is space, at least there seems to be some space there. But uh, currently, it's not happening, I believe. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Mohammed, there's one more question for you. So you mentioned that the number of lawyers involved in refugee legal aid in Egypt has remained roughly the same for the past 10 years. Uh, in your view, is there any reason for why this is the case, for why the numbers are so low? Is it the lack of interest? Is it a lack of uh, sensitization among the legal fraternity on refugee issues? And how would you suggest is the best way for more lawyers to be involved in the issue, particularly within Egypt? Okay. As far as I think the, the, the topic of, of to provide legal assistance for refugees or to be interested in refugees is not, it, it was not common in Egypt. Even if when, 10 years ago, uh, even the Egyptian and the national don't know uh, what's the meaning of refugee and what the Sudanese is, uh, refugees or not. This is the first. About the, the lawyers, also not, not all of the lawyers uh, are interested to providing legal assistance for refugees. And so this is the reason why the, the lawyers are not uh, eager to, to, to involve in this type of providing legal assistance. Uh, so uh, the number of lawyers who are interested in this uh, issue is not high. Uh, and if we speak about from like 10 years ago, we have five lawyers and we can by the name. And what we have only five lawyers, just lawyers who are like established organization providing legal assistance. But now we have only two organizations in Egypt providing legal assistance. Each office has uh, between five or uh, six lawyers providing legal assistance. And sometimes, and sometimes uh, uh, for example, in FRR, Egyptian Revolution for Rights, we started to uh, build the network from the lawyers in, in different uh, government, but by the end, and to be honest, this is not sustainable uh, solution or sustainable network, because the lawyers can, from in one myth, can go to another areas. How we can do that? The first thing that we, I think, we have a problem in Egypt. Uh, what is the problem? The first, all the legal uh, or, or uh, the, um, uh, the capacity building programs about the refugee law is providing in English. So this is the first 
one. So that means that all the lawyers or most of the lawyers will be excluded from this area. The second, even the second problem also, if we uh, build the capacity of lawyers in Egypt, that we need to engage with them or to uh, recruit them within the organization. But in the same time, we have, we face the financial issue or in, in, in light of lakes of financial resources, we cannot hire or recruit these officers, these uh, lawyers. So uh, I think what we can do that, and, and I, I already speak with some from CMRS to, uh, at American University in Cairo to design a specific capacity uh, building program for Egyptian lawyers to providing uh, the specific trainings uh, focus in legal issue related to refugees for lawyers. And we can co uh, cooperate with the Bar Association in Egypt and uh, also other uh, universities, uh, faculties of law in Egypt to build this this uh, layer from uh, Egyptian lawyers. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Very well noted. I will pass along your, uh, <laughs> your recommendation. Um, I have uh, one question for Nora from Maya. Uh, she says, thanks so much for the great panel and the thoughtful discussion. So for Nora, do you think humanitarian organizations should avoid doing legal aid altogether in light of the issues that you raise? Thank you for the question. I was almost waiting for it. Uh, I don't think that the humanitarian organizations did, uh, should stay out of it altogether, but I still think it's important to, to critically consider what happens when uh, when humanitarian organizations combine rights and humanitarianism uh, in such an explicit way as in legal aid. Um, so I think as, as Miriam mentioned in um, raising one of the comments in the chat box that um, there is this tendency of, of having a rather short sight approach to rights uh, when humanitarianism, um, when human, it's delivered by humanitarian organizations. And I think this follows from, from this emergency response that humanitarian organizations often, uh, often still take, even though um, I'm aware of this um, uh, shift towards the right-based approach. I think this is generally the case. Um, I can also address um, the question from Daria Oskul. Um, I'll read it. Um, whether you think legal aid organizations should change the focus of their activities? For instance, should they be focusing more on advocacy, strategic lit litigation advocacy at international level? Um, I'm not sure about the international level, but what I can say in the case of, of Lebanon is that there are uh, other um, legal aid organizations or ac more activist organizations that are doing strategic litigation in Lebanon uh, with some success. But I think the, again, the, the problem when if it should be done by humanitarian organization is that there is generally this risk of backlash uh, as this is a more confrontational strategy. Um, and um, for a humanitarian organization, they would also have to consider if this would potentially cause harm to the, to the individual client if their identity is exposed and so on. And then you also have in Lebanon this very strong problem of, of um, rule of law. So these cases that are, are very uh, well known for being successful in, in litigating refugee rights, they're not, even though if they have proved that they, uh, the policies are not consistent with neither international law or, or Lebanese law, it doesn't necessarily create change in policy in Lebanon, uh, so that the, the judgments, even though they are, might be successful, they're not necessarily enforced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. Uh, we have a question from Diana that I know Abdullah told me he would like to take. So in countries that have not ratified the 1951 Refugee Convention, civil society often tries to fill the gaps in assistance of refugees as mentioned by the presenters. So Diana was wondering if the speakers could perhaps discuss the role of the UNHCR in the MENA region, especially in countries not party to the convention, and how can UNHCR offices in these countries address protection gaps? So Abdullah, I know you wanted to take that. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I just wanted to mention in regard to the Iraq and the role that UNHCR plays that in Iraq, the UNHCR um, has signed an MOU with the government in 2016. Um, 
And that MOU uh, states clearly that the Iraqi government has the registration and documentation that provides registration and documentation, while UNICEF provides advice, technical, and other supports to, to, to the interior ministry. And, um, but of course, we, couldn't, uh, we were trying to get the, this documentation. We were not able to obtain the full content of that uh, MOU. But in regard to the, um, what is in the Kaira in the Kurdistan region, we found out that the uh, Asajj and the security server has the control over most of the security and the entrance. Once the Asajj get the approval, then the UNICEF plays a huge role in the uh, RS, uh, RSD, which is the uh, refugee status determination and the registration process that provide legal support and advice, and it has a partners in the, in the KRI, works with the different organizations that we, with Miriam, we contacted and interviewed these organizations on behalf of the UNICEF provide legal advocacy, legal support, and civil uh, support with the civil documentation. So they play a role, huge role in, in fact, in the, in the KRI and in the Iraq in supporting um, refugees. But as, as I said, that the uh, Ministry of Interior in the Iraq and the uh, social uh, security service in the KRI has more control or security control, then UNSCI has that secondary role where you can uh, gap this, uh, sorry, fill that gap that exists in the protection. So they do that. But then the issue arises is when these people are, uh, there are uh, people of concern such as Turkish, Iranian and, uh, and uh, Palestinians who do not get uh, Iraqi or oh, UNHCR certificate, uh, and these people do not get the uh, assistance that they should receive, which kind of excludes them from uh, getting legal support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdallah. And I know uh, Martin would also like to uh, answer this question as well. So Martin? Yeah, I mean, I, I won't be able to answer it, but I'll, I'll give you some, my opinion on it. Um, I think, um, I don't know how to say this politely, but I think sometimes too hard of a line is drawn between states that are and are not signatory to the Refugee Convention. Um, and, you know, this is said without trying to disregard or minim overly minimize kind of the importance of international law um, in all sorts of different ways. Um, but, you know, in, in any other community um, that we'd be talking about, um, the absence of a state being party to an international treaty wouldn't stop our legal conversation. You know, that certainly children had rights before the CRC, persons with disability had rights before the Convention on Disabilities. I mean, in many cases, these international treaties come out of local norms that exist within local legal systems. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to divert ourselves with a big complicated conversation about the role of international law, but I guess what I would say is, what's the role of UNHCR in, in non-party states? It's kind of the same as the role in state parties. It's to facilitate engagement by the local legal community with through local legal processes to enforce, if not the Refugee Convention directly, then equivalent norms. And I think that has proven successful in a number of jurisdictions. I think what is not um, the case um, for UNHCR in these countries is to adopt a more political, kind of pragmatic, um, ad hoc kind of approach to negotiating. I mean, it may also do that. I'm not trying to say these are exclusive strategies, but I don't fundamentally see the role of UNHCR in supporting, um, for example, litigation and legal aid in non-state parties as fundamentally different than in state parties. Now, that may be a controversial view, but I thought I would uh, put that out there. Thank you so much, Martin. Unfortunately, friends, we only have five more minutes left. Um, but before I have one, or I uh, go to one final question, I want to mention that uh, Miriam had an idea that tomorrow there is a coffee break session uh, from 3.30 to 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and if you would like to join us, we'll be continuing the conversation since we won't get to uh, all the questions today, unfortunately. So again, tomorrow, if you would like to join us from 3.30 to 4 UK time during the coffee break session, 
to continue the conversation on protection and refugee legal aid in the MENA region, we would love to see you there. Um, so the final question that I'm going to take, and uh, we can decide who, who would like to take this question. Um, Martin, you mentioned that what rights do refugees care about? So when we look at this question, it could also potentially result in a hierarchization of some rights uh, being potentially more important than others, and what implications this could possibly have for refugee legal protection uh, within the region. So I will open that up to perhaps whoever wants to answer that question. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, um, but only a very brief one. I mean, it, it's, it's all great to commit ourselves to the you know universality and in, indivisibility of, of human rights but i mean i think when it comes to a programming point of view um we often have to develop different programs of legal aid i mean mohammed spoke about that within efr for example um and i think that likely has to respond to the particular situation that's at hand and we have to recognize that that's going to change over time and so one of the things i've noticed in cairo certainly and you see this with the development of efr after initial programs at uh, like Amira is a movement as populations become more settled and as status becomes less of an issue from issues of refugee status determination through to a range of other issues that reflect the the needs and interests of refugees in a more protracted situation um, so I think primarily the the refugee communities need to be part of that conversation I mean unfortunately not a lot of work I think has been done often in getting them to map their legal agenda um, you know, the, the little bit of work that I've seen done often talks about legal aid primarily as status determination and, and asks generally newly arrived refugee communities about their, their prioritization of that. And, and generally they prioritize that quite highly, I mean, in the studies that I've seen, but um, I think probably a more nuanced um, conversation needs to be had with, with local refugee communities and probably also local legal communities. I mean, in terms of what's, what's the low hanging legal fruit, you know, it may be that birth registration is the most um, will produce the biggest short term benefits for the littlest um, initial cost. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, now we have one minute left. Uh, so I would just like to thank everyone for for joining us in this really fantastic panel session. Uh, I think we had very diverse but also interesting discussions on a more general basis on what it means to empower refugees within the context of protection and legal aid. We heard uh, Maryam and Abdullah speak about the Kurdish region of Iraq, and then we went to Egypt with Mohammed Farahat, and then finally to Lebanon with Nora. Um, so I would just like to thank all of our panelists and of course all of our attendees we hope that you enjoyed this panel session and again please be in touch please join us tomorrow during the coffee break session from 3 30 to 4 where we can discuss uh, further currently we have a 10 minute break and then i encourage you all to join our keynote session today, which will be starting in 10 minutes. Uh, it is by Professor B.S. Chimney, who I think, again, needs no introduction. He will be discussing the 1951 Convention at 70, a post-colonial perspective. So once again, thank you to all of our panelists, Martin, Miriam, Abdullah, Mohammed, and Nora. And I look forward to seeing you uh, throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.